Hey everyone, I'm Josh. Thanks for the introduction there. So I'm glad you guys didn't like, I sent a picture to you guys to show my family. I'm glad you didn't put that up there because I'm actually wearing the shirt in that picture and I, I would have been really embarrassed to be wearing the picture in there or wearing the same shirt as I had in the picture. Um, I, I, I would have realized the, the weirdness of that. So you're going to have to excuse me. I'll probably drink a lot of water because it's cold outside and that means it's really dry. So what I'm going to do this morning is uh, try, you know, I'm going to preach a little mini-series called Real Jesus, Real Life, um, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to preach this from the Gospel of John. So if anyone's really excited, I really love the Gospel of John, and uh, I know that it's really great, so, um, as is the rest of the Bible. Uh, but okay, so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm, I'm going to read the text, I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to jump right into it. So be prepared, it's like the third time you've already prayed, so that's good, right? Okay, so I'm going to read from John. You'll find it in John 5. This is verses 19 through 29. And if I'm doing this right, yeah, it's going to be right there. No, it's not. Eep, come on. I did press the button. It's not working. It's going through the whole thing. No? No? All right. All right, never mind. So you got to open your Bibles. Sorry. Um <laughs> <clears throat> so, okay, I'm just going to do that quick, otherwise we're going to stand here and I'm going to look silly. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read, this is John 5, verses 19 through 29. So Jesus said to them, and this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. For he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of life judgment. Uh, Will you pray with me, please? Father, I'm thankful for this morning. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here to preach. And God, it's not me getting up here to preach, but it is, Spirit, you speaking through me. And so I pray that the words of Christ would fill people's hearts this morning, that it would encourage people, that it would strengthen people, and that it would help people to go out and preach the good news of Jesus Christ to others this morning and the rest of this week. So I give you thanks, God, for this opportunity to do that, and I pray that together as a church, we would be able to worship you through the hearing of your word. So we give you thanks, God, and we pray this in Jesus' wonderful, great, and perfect name. Amen. So uh, looking at this text this morning, I think we can figure out right away that Jesus thinks that, and we know, that words are powerful, aren't they? Words are extremely powerful. I mean, some of the, the biggest biggest things that have happened in the history of our civilization, the biggest developments that we've ever had, center on words. So like think of the alphabet. So like the Phoenicians were the first ones to really put together a full alphabet over like 4,000 years ago. That's a long time ago, but that was a major development in civilization as a whole. Or think about the printing press by Gutenberg. The printing press fundamentally changed how we communicated as people. It went from only the elites could really understand and be able to be literate to where it introduced the ability for everyone, for the common persons to be literate. And then also like more recent things like the telephone, which is, I mean, essentially just us being able to give voice to our words over a long fancy wire, which it's not that way anymore, but that's how it started. And then we have the internet and we have computers, right? I mean, basically the internet and computers is Uh, is all words. I mean, even the internet is like coded with words and numbers. I mean, numbers are in there too. But I mean, it's essentially, words are incredibly important and have been incredibly important to the entire development of us being able to sit here this morning together. Words have been incredibly important. And actually, some research that people have done into words has shown that we as people, on average, 
from the limited amount of research that we're able to do on a subject like this, speak about 16,000 words a day. Um, now, some of you are going to be a lot less than that because you don't like talking, and some of you are going to talk way too much. And that is definitely me. I love to talk, and I talk way too much and way too loudly. Um, and that's passed down to my kids, so our house is a little bit chaotic. Um, but we speak about 16,000 words on average. However, uh, they've been able to, it's, it's a little bit easier to do uh, research on this, but they've been able to uh, estimate that we hear or take in about 100,000 words a day. That's a lot. 100K is a lot. So we hear a lot of words, and the words that we use and the words that we hear have great power. So we hear, you know, like I said, we give about 60, or we, we speak about 16,000 words a day. We hear almost f- like over five times that much, and we hear so many different competing messages every single day of our life. We hear things like, get this and you'll have a better life, or it's like, do this and you'll have a better life, or we hear words from other people. It's not just like advertisements and things that we hear, the promises that we hear in a culture. We'll hear things that'll be like everything from like, uh, you know, I want to be your friend to I never want to talk to you again. Words have great power to bring life and they have great power to bring death in our lives. And we hear a lot of these incoming life messages even. Even messages that are supposed to give us life, they ultimately disappoint us, don't they? Because if we believe the promises of some of those words, they're going to eventually let us down. And so Jesus here, he's going to start speaking. This is actually in John 5 is the first time that Jesus gives a public discourse in the Gospel of John. Uh, where he's out in public giving this discourse to not just his apostles or not just to certain people, but he's gathered them all together and he's starting to deliver public addresses to people. And Jesus is going to tell us that the word of God has the words of life. And we're going to see that here this morning. So uh, we already read the text. Uh, is, it, are we gonna, is it working now? It's not bummer. Oh, well, no, it's totally fine. I can't even read it, so I can't even do it up there anyway. So I'm glad I did this instead. I, I do. Yes, it's in my wife's pocket. <laughs> um, it's not up here. I can't just throw it to you. Um, okay, so, but we're going to focus in here on a couple of passages, and it's going to really help us inform the rest of what Jesus had to say here, say here in, the, in the opening of his public discourse. So we're going to focus on verses 24 and 25, and we're going to drill down even further eventually into two specific words that Jesus uses here. But the reason I want to focus on 24 and 25 is because in those two verses, Jesus starts each sentence with truly, truly. And in the Gospel of John and in the Gospels in general, when Jesus speaks and says truly, truly, that means listen up. And when basically in verse 24 and 25, what he does is he says something and then he reiterates it in verse 25. And if he says truly, truly before each of those things, he says it twice in succession. So that probably means that we should be paying attention, right? We should be paying attention to what he has to say. And what we're going to see here, I'm going to read verses 24 and 25, and then we're going to look at three things that Jesus wants us to do to be able to hear the words of life. And so look at verse 24. He says, truly, truly, saying, listen up, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And then in 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And so there's two things in here that we want to drill down on. We want to drill down on the words hear and believe. And this is going to tell us to do three different things. That that's, this is essentially what we're going to focus on this whole time is three things. is Jesus, with the words of life, he wants us to listen, he wants us to believe, and he wants us to obey his words. And so first of all, we're going to look at listen. And so we want to listen what Jesus is saying here. The words that Jesus has have great power. Because words, like I said before, are incredibly important, aren't they? And to the Jews at that time, and to us too, because, you know, we we believe a lot of the theological things that the Jews believed then, Jews really believed at that time that words had great power and they had creative power power, that words were essential to who God was. If you look at, I mean, just, you don't have to go there, but in Genesis 1-3, the first action that God ever takes into our world, what's the first thing that he does? Yes, he speaks. In Genesis 1-3, I like this. People are interacting with me. This is great. Um, and that normally doesn't happen, even with my kids or something. Um, <laughs> Jesus, in Genesis 1-3, God said, his words have creative power. It says, God spoke 
and it was brought into being. Jews and the people, the Israelites, believed that God's words were incredibly powerful because they had the power to create. And it says in the gospel, or in the, uh, the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, at the beginning of the book of Hebrews, he says, God upholds the universe by the word of his power. Just think about that. God's creative power, his words, his very words hold up everything. You can imagine that when God speaks, it undergirds everything and it's in everything. Just think of it. I had uh, an old mentor who used to say that it's like, just imagine that God's words bind every molecule of existence together. That's amazing. That's why we can be good scientists, right? Because we're essentially just digging in deeper into God's creative world. And God spoke to his people too, right? So his creative, he has creative power and it has creative force and it upholds everything. But also God's words are incredibly important to establishing our entire lives. And it was, in, it was essential to the Israelites, to the people this time that would be hearing Jesus, that God's words helped his people and helped shape who they were. Because the, he spoke through the prophets. He spoke through Moses to give them the law. He promised Abraham through his words that he would build a people. And he gave the other people the prophets to hear God's word when things were extremely dire. Especially uh, when they were in Babylon and they were in captivity. God gave them that law. God gave them his words. And it's hard for us to understand sometimes because we're in such a culture now that like really like our existence is based on our own words, isn't it? A lot of times we speak, you know, uh, we speak our own truth and we speak our own things into existence. We don't understand that like a, the idea of like a king or a ruler speaking to us, but they would have understood that completely. And we would have understood it that way until maybe a couple hundred years ago because uh, most people had kings or, you know, sultans or emperors or things like that, that their word, when they spoke, things happened. And that's kind of the way things were until recently. But they would have fundamentally understood this. And then John does something really, really interesting here. If we go back to the beginning of the Gospel of John, what does God do? Or what does John do when speaking about God? Uh, if you look at John 1, 1 through 3, uh, some of you might be familiar with this passage. Hey, it's working. All right. Excellent. I didn't even notice it until right now. So if you look at John 1, what does it say? The author, the author of John 5, who's the author of the whole gospel, the Apostle John, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So what John is doing here is the Israelites and his Greek listeners, both at this time, if you're not familiar with biblical times, like there would have been Greeks, Greek speakers, and there would have been Jewish people in, during that time period. And John is speaking to the Greeks and to the Jews during this. And what he does is he takes this idea of the word, the word of God, which in Greek, it means logos. And this word logos had kind of a meaning that was a little bit different for Jews as it was for Greeks, but he kind of melds it together to kind of all really be able to help them understand. So the Greeks would have looked at this word logos where it says the word. And what they thought about the word logos is they, they viewed this like uh, the idea of a supreme being or the word or like this rationality, this idea that there was creative order. And he kind of melds it with the idea of how the Jews viewed the word of God, which we've already talked about. God's words were incredibly important. He kind of brings these things together, the idea of God as the word and his wisdom, and to the Greeks, this idea of creative order and puts them together. They would have understood and would have tracked with this idea that words, that what God says is incredibly powerful and has creative power. And Jesus is likening himself to that if we go back to John 5 here. Jesus says that there is power in his words, but he's not going to leave it there. He's going to take it a step further, and it's going to be so much more than that. So we have Jesus wants us to listen to those powerful words, but then he also wants us to believe that the words of Jesus are from him, the Son of God. So look at uh, John 5, 19 through 23. Yay. All right. <clears throat> So look at 19. You can look up there. It says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. There's truly, truly again. So he's already saying when he starts his discourse, he's like, listen up. But only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. 
that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so Jesus is likening these words of power, he's likening these words to that of God the Father. And that was extremely scandalous. The couple verses before that basically spell out for people who couldn't put it together already. That's like the, the previous two verses, 17 and 18, basically said, Jesus is calling himself equal with God. And that was not a good thing to everybody. That's essentially the breakdown of verses 17 and 18 for you. Um, so he's likening that he has the same authority as the Son being sent by the Father. And I mean, if we go back, you know, I said that God gave words to prophets for them to be able to speak the words of God, but the prophets would have done likewise in, in, base, in giving out the words of God and having great power in their words, right? A lot of it's recorded in our Bibles and is the Spirit-inspired Word of God that we use to live our lives. But none of them claimed ever to have equal authority with God, did they? None of them ever talked like that. But Jesus was. He was likening himself to the Father, calling himself equal with God. And we have the whole story. I mean, the disciples would have probably been shocked, right? I feel like every time I preach out of any gospel, I have to help us realize that a lot of times we'll like, you know, rag, we'll totally bag on the disciples because they're dumb. And we need to realize that they, we would have been in the same position as them if we didn't live 2,000 years later. Let's never forget that. The disciples, they only had their story. We've got the whole story all laid out for us, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, God's word for us. So don't bag on the disciples too hard. They are dumb sometimes, but so are we. Um, but then he's going to go on here, and he's going to reiterate his claim in verses 26 and 27. Yes. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And so he's reiterating his claim here in verses 26 and 27. So in 26, he's basically saying, you know, the Father has granted me the same life-giving power as he has and so he's just saying, I'm not an agent or I'm not a prophet. I'm not just bringing the words of God, but I have equal God-given authority as the Son of God. And this is kind of like, I, I liken it, I'm a history guy. I liken it to uh, on a battlefield. If they're going to call for like a truce or they're going to try and work their differences out, you know, hey, we've already killed a bunch of our people. Let's try and work it out. Um, they would send a messenger, right, to go out to the other king or the other general, whatever, to kind of like, you know, they're going to parlay about this. This is like the rare times when the king or the general himself would come as the messenger, right? The person who would be sent out in there. There's famous, there's famous things in history where that has happened, where it's really like, these are serious words because the king or the general is here. Because that was dangerous, right? You've got a king or a general just putting themselves out into the field of battle, that's not a good thing. They almost never did that because that wasn't a good idea because they usually ended up dead um, as a result of that. Or I think of, it, I think of it this way, maybe more of a contemporary idea, is like whenever I would work at my job and, you know, like we, you'd get like those memos from the corporate office or whatever and you'd have to, you know, your manager, your assistant manager would have to have a meeting and go like, okay, guys, I know this is boring, but we got to go through this memo. And they'd talk about whatever the president of the company said. But like there was, I remember there was a time that there was such an import important message that the president showed up at our office, and that reminds me, okay, like, whoa, this is really serious because he's showing up to say something. It's not like he was just down the street having a meal and decided to show up. Like, he showed up because his message meant something. So, like, when your boss, or like the boss's boss's boss shows up for something, you listen. And this is what Jesus is saying. It's like, hey, listen, the boss is here. Listen up. And then in verse 27, he takes it even further because he uses this phrase, this title, son of man. And this is used quite often, uh, probably most famously in Daniel 7. And this is really what he's likening it to because he's referencing specifically to his authority as the judge at the end of all things. Really kind of in a way, Jesus is saying, hey, listen, I've already likened myself to God's creative power. Now what I'm saying is that I'm going to be there at the end too to judge. He's essentially, before he says it in Revelation, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega, the beginning and the end. I was with God. You know, later he'll say, before Abraham was, I am. You know, that's essentially likening himself to the creative force of God. But then he's saying, I'm the son of man. I will, I'm there at the end as well. And so, which is hence why we get verses 28 and 29. Um, I don't have those up on the board, but I still will read those again just to reiterate. He says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all, all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. He's essentially likening himself to 
the son of man ideology of being the beginning and the end. And so verses 28 and 29, they're really like the end result of what we believe, right? When we believe Jesus is the son of God, we will listen and we'll believe those words and they'll shape us into people who either do good or do evil. And that's really kind of the third thing that we want to talk about. We want to listen to his words. We want to believe that he has the words as the son of God. And third, we want to obey the words of Jesus as the words of life. And so the reason I put this here is because this word here in verse 25 and, or verse 24 and 25, this word here, it means to listen, like I used earlier, but it also means, literally, it means to yield in obedience. That's what that word means. And that would not have been, so really what it means is we're not just listening, but we're sort of shaping ourselves around the words that Jesus speaks as the powerful son of God. And this would have been incredibly familiar for uh, people at that time to hear that word because going back, uh, the word hear actually had two connotations that match up with this. So if you look at the famous prayer in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, the Shema prayer, which is a very famous part of Jewish liturgy, liturgy, liturgy um, they would have said, hear, O Israel, the God is one, is how that prayer starts. And it says, hear. And the word hear would have meant, listen, like take in the words, but then yield in obedience to them. So it's like hear and do those words is what it says when it's saying here. It says listen and do. So they would have been incredibly familiar with that. And think about like the concept of the law. I mentioned before that, you know, God gave the law through Abraham, through his powerful words. And the law really established these powerful words that they didn't just listen to, but they shaped their lives around it. The Israelites arranged their whole lives around the words of God found in God's law. And so I think of it, uh, maybe, maybe a good way of putting this, is think of, let, think of a tree. Um, you know, when a tree is especially in like a shaded part or anywhere where you plant like a weird tree, and you always see like one that's like kind of all twisted and weird looking and everything like that. And what they're doing is trees will seek out the sun to be able to obtain life, won't they? Because the sun is life-giving to them. And so kind of in the same way that a tree is going to be able to sort of shape itself and move itself to find light to be able to survive and to have life, that's kind of what God's words are meant for us to do. God's words are the sun beaming down on us, and we're to shape our lives around it, like a tree shaping itself around the sun to find and get life. And so we look at that, and that's what Jesus is really focusing on here, is the words of life. Granted, he's likening himself to the Son of Man as the one who will come in judgment. But what he focuses on here is how his words will give life to the people, and how his words have the power for life. If you look at verse five, or, yeah, chapter 5, verse 20, he says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. That's what he says. Uh, he's alluding to this material power that he has over all of life. He says, the greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. So he's saying that the words of life literally have material life power. And so I wanted to kind of give you an example of this because he says the greater works. Like, what does greater works mean? That's kind of a, an odd phrase, right? Like he says, basically, like, the God's already, do, God's already doing, whoa. See, this is why um, I taped my notes down. Um, I told Joe this before, um, but uh, a couple weeks ago I preached at a friend's church and I had my notes just kind of loose and I went like this and they went flying off the stage. And uh, to the video feed of those people, all they saw is me kind of look down and they just dive off the stage to go get my notes. So um, that was really funny. Um, a- afterwards, everyone was like, we were totally shocked that you just dove right off the stage to go get your notes because there was no one in like the first four rows. So I was like, I guess I got to go get them. So anyways, so now I'm throwing remotes around. Um, sorry. Um, so Jesus is alluding to this material power, this, this physical power of him to have the power of life because he says, God is doing great work, but I'm doing that work too, and greater works will I do. What is Jesus talking about? Well, he's talking about two things. So the first thing he's talking about is he does have the literal power over life and death. And so I want to go to a famous example in the Gospel of John, in John 11. This is the raising of Lazarus. So what happens is Jesus, he has a friend named Lazarus, and he dies. And, you know, he basically says to his disciples, like, oh, we'll just walk there. We'll be fine. We'll get there. You know, and uh, he, they tell him that he dies, and like, if you come quickly, you know, you can save him or whatever. And, you know, he's like, oh, we'll take our time, because he's basically doing it to show his power. And he shows up, and everyone's really sad. And Jesus is sad, too. You know, has that, uh, right before this, it says Jesus wept. He was sad for his friend, and he had died. And on a deeper level, he was grieving for the fact that death has to exist. 
And then I'm just going to read a small passage of that here in John 11, 38 through 44. It's right there, right? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. And this is Lazarus' tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, Lazarus, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And this is one of the most powerful stories in the entire Bible. Like it makes me emotional just talking about it because it's amazing. Jesus speaks and a man is alive again after being dead and stinky for four days. He comes out and he's alive again. And that's absolutely amazing. He is likening himself. The greater works that I'm bringing is that I will literally raise people from the dead, is what he says. My word's at power. But he's also alluding later on in verses 20 and 21, 21 specifically, he's alluding to the spiritual nature of his words because he says this, for as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. When he speaks of those greater works, he's not just speaking of raising people from the dead. He's saying there's a spiritual aspect to this as well. Because is everyone going to die and he's going to raise them up? Yes, at the end of things, he will. Because he will raise them all up, like he says at the end, to a resurrection of either judgment, of death, or to life. But he's saying that spiritually, we will all be risen from the dead who believe and trust and obey in his words. Jesus gives life to those who are dead. In John 14, I'm going to actually preach on this already. Uh, Earlier in that uh, than what I had preached on at the beginning of John 14, Jesus again, he says, greater works will you do. And I think that's the real key here to understanding that is because in John 14, when Jesus says greater works will you you do, is he saying every single one of you is going to go out and raise someone from the dead? No, because that entire passage, what is he saying? The greater works that we're going to do is that we're going to give life through the words of the good news of Jesus Christ. There's a spiritual aspect to it, and our words can bring life to people. That's what he's saying here. Because he's saying, who's really dead? Who is dead here? And what he's saying, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's find out. The Bible tells us who's dead. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Paul gives us the answer here. It's you who are dead. Following the prince of the power of the air, he's talking about Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Another good word there is children of judgment, because wrath leads to judgment, right? Jesus is going to bring judgment because that passage is really telling us what? Again, that we're all dead. We're all dead in our sins. We have an inability. It is impossible for us in ourselves to give ourselves life. And we see that in the words that we listen to. Going back to the beginning of the message, right? When we listen to other words and we trust in things that don't give us life, they lead to death. Oh man, if I could only get that person to like me, man, then I would be all right. If I could just get that raise and make six figures, we'd be all right. And we'd have life. Small examples of the kind of words that we hear in our lives that we think bring us life, but they only bring us death because they're coming from other dead people. (laughs) Right? And it's been this way since the Garden of Eden, right? Because God, in the beginning, he spoke and his creative power made all things, as we've already said. But what happened? Satan came into the garden. And what's the first thing he starts doing? He speaks words. Words that he think is, that that Eve and Adam think is giving life to them, right? But what is it really doing? It's introducing death and suffering and pain into the world because they don't trust God. His words deceive them and they're deceived and they, essentially the fall happens. They fall and they go into sin and death and sadness and sickness and all these things. Suffering enter into the world. Because of words, words that promised life but gave death. 
But then what happens? God doesn't leave us that way, right? He sends them out of the garden because they can't be in God's presence anymore because God is completely holy, right? So he cannot stand evil to be in his presence. And so he sends them out of the garden. But what does he do? Does he just leave them and say, all right, guys, get to work, you know? Like, sorry, you're gone. Um, No, he promises them. He gives them the promise in the euangelion, which is just a big word for basically the first gospel proclamation. He promises that he will send a redeemer. And he promises Abraham again that he will build a people that will be a light to the nations. God's words are speaking, promising life. And then he sent the very word of God into the world through Jesus, as we already learned through the beginning of the Gospel of John. And Jesus came into the world as the word of God to bring us redemption, to bring us truth, and to bring us life. And again, going back to that king on the battlefield analogy— Jesus came into our battlefield of this world and brought the words of life to all of us. Because really what was happening before Jesus came, we were at war with him. We were his enemies. But he sent the king, the very the son of God, into this world to bring life. And then what happens? It's not just a king bringing the message, but he sent the king to die. Because Jesus goes to the cross and he dies for us. And what's the last thing that Jesus does before he dies? He speaks. He says, it is finished. His words say, it is finished. It is done. The battle is over. I have brought life into this world, and I have given myself in your place. The words of Christ give life, and when we trust in him and we believe in him, we are counted righteous. We're counted good before God. The beautiful good news of Christ is the judgment Christ speaks of in this passage was ultimately put on him. We deserve death and judgment as his enemies, believing words of death instead of life. But what happens? We are given life and we're given mercy through Christ, through the word of God. He came into this world to give us life and to ultimately die to do that. Amazing. Jesus is amazing. And what he wants us to do now with this, he wants us to listen to his words. He wants us to believe that that is true and to obey those, to shape our lives around those things. And what does he want us to do? He wants us to use our words to give life, right? He wants us to give our words to go out there and to give life. I say this to my kids all the time, and it sounds lame, but we use our words to build people up, not to tear them down, because that's what Jesus did. He came into this world to give life, to build people up, to bring life, not to bring death. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, is what Paul says. There is no condemnation for those. But we trust him with life, and we give those words of life. And I think just a little bit, I want to give you a little bit of a... um, how we can do that. So if we look at Proverbs 16.24, it says gracious words, or another way of saying that is kind words. Um, Not exactly a direct translation, but gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. And again, this might sound really, really lame, but I truly believe that the best, some of the best things that we can do is to bring kindness into this world. And that is a way that we can give life through the power of Jesus, is through kindness and through gracious words to other people. And that's really more for all the truth tellers out there, right? For all the people that love to tell the truth and maybe just have a little bit too much of an edge of being a giant jerk, um, there's the <laughs> kindness and the words of life. Right? But on the other side of that, I want you to understand that this part is for the kind hearted people that won't say the things they're supposed to, because that's me. I am the person, I won't say something because I don't want people to hate me. I don't want people to be, think I'm, you know, terrible. And so what I do is I tend to trend towards the kind hearted side. I don't like conflict. Conflict scares the heck out of me, it makes me sweat and turn red. So don't. I want you to hear this. Those who are truth tellers have some kindness, have gracious words that are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the body. But for the kind-hearted people out there, this is me speaking to me, this is me speaking to me. Truth, <laughs> tell truth. Don't trade truth for false unity among brothers and sisters in Christ. Be okay with being able to say truthful things because saying kind things, sometimes it's not kind to not tell people the truth. And so we need to remember that, that gracious words sometimes are biting words. Faithful are the wounds of, the friend, of a friend, is what it says in Proverbs also. If we wound a friend and we do it with a kind, loving, life-giving heart, hard words will still be good. A wound will be a, from a faithful friend is a good thing. But also, 
what, we do, what do we want to do? We want to go out and do the greater works that Jesus said to us, the greater things that he talked about. We want to be able to preach the good news of life to other people. We want to preach the good news, right? We want to go out and we want to tell other people so that they can listen and then they can believe those words. Go out and tell the truth. And so that doesn't necessarily look like you need to leave these doors and go out and sit on a corner and don't do that today. It's cold. You will get really cold if you go do that. But preach the words in your everyday life. Do that with your kids. That's the, that's the easiest thing I can tell a father or a mother to do is preach those words to your kids. Preach that as a husband and wife to one another because those relationships, they're forced to be around you. So you have to talk to them about the gospel and Jesus because they don't have a choice. They, kids have to live with you. Well, I mean, they don't have to, but they do because they don't have other place to go. So preach the good news to your kids. They'll want to hear it. It might take years to see any fruit from that. But preach the good news to your kids. Preach the good news to your wife. Preach it to your friends. Preach it to the people who are forced to be in your life. And good things will come of it because life will come out of those things. But then also the other thing, we want people to obey, right? So we want to teach other people, and that is through discipleship. That's what Jesus did. The word disciple means learner. We want to be someone that can go out and disciple other people, to have them learn from us because we're learning from Jesus. And that's really how the world gets changed, doesn't it? Is it's through the simple everyday discipleship relationships that we have with other people. Big things happen in this world. Big things like the word going out when the printing press came out and the Bibles were able to send all over the world. Big things changed as a result of that, right? It basically was the spark that ignited the modern missionary movement hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But it was done through everyday relationships. It was done through being learners of Christ together. So I want to encourage you to take initiative to be able to preach the good news and teach Jesus' words, but don't do it alone. I always want to encourage that with everybody. Don't ever go anything alone. I always tell people not to read the Bible by themselves, and then I realize that's a bad thing to say. Read the Bible by yourselves, but don't just do it by yourself. Do it with other people too. Do life and do community together. Disciple one another. Preach the good news, and you will be able to listen and hear the words of life in Jesus. You will believe the words of Jesus, and we will be able to obey to shape our very lives around him. So Jesus' words, the word of God, gives the words of life. Remember that today, and go out and do that in your regular, everyday relationships. Let's pray together. Father God, I'm thankful for your word, that you are, Jesus, the word of God. That your words give us life. That it doesn't, it will raise people at the end of all things. That your words will speak and you will make a new world. But God, you started, you made this world and we sinned against you and we were separated from you, but you sent the word of God into this world to speak true life into our lives and to ultimately die on the cross and to rise again. And Jesus, we thank you that one day you will return again and your words will be powerful in reshaping this whole world into something where death and sickness and sadness will be gone. And so we pray, God, that you would help us to know and to trust you, to listen to your words, to believe that you have the words of life as the Son of God, and to obey your words because they are powerful and they give us life. God, we give you thanks and we pray this in your Son's wonderful, perfect, and holy name. Amen.